I'm here to talk, uh, as, as you know, I'm a, many of you know I'm an economist, so I'm going to be talking about the economic approach to voting. So I'm going to have two roles here. I'm going to summarize some of what conventional economic analysis says and then sort of give my, my cynical commentary, as we'll see. The mainstream economists, as usual, are really smart people and they have nice conclusions and so forth, but often that where they take it just, just shows that actually they, they know what they want to do beforehand. They have their political preconceptions and all this uh, mainstream formal garb is just really window dressing. So that I'll give you a little hint of where I'm going there. Also, let me disclose up front, I know people have different strategies and views. I, when I was younger, I used to go vote and I would, I would typically just go in and on the ballot pick the, the third party candidate, whatever the race was that you know, was closest to the libertarian, because in some races they didn't have that, so I would pick like the constitutionalist or whatever. At this point in my life, I, I don't vote, uh, but it's not that I think there's something intrinsically wrong with it. I know some libertarians you know, think that, oh, if you're voting, you're like in league with the state. So I, it's not that, and also, I don't want you guys to be defensive in case you are, like you know who you're gonna vote for, you've already done early voting. My point here is not to wag my finger and say, what did you do that for? It's, it's, I, I do kind of wonder that, but um, I, I'm not here to criticize. I'm just curious, baffled. Uh, and, and so it's more, I want to just give you a framework and help you think through um, just to, to see, because as we'll see, a lot of the analysis of voting is really nonsensical when you think about it. So first of all, this whole notion of get out the vote or rock the vote, right? So there was a thing recently where Justin Timberlake, uh, you know, the, the pop star, he got in trouble because he went and voted in, I think it was in Memphis. Uh, I don't know if he lives in Nashville and that's why he was voting in Memphis, but in any event, he was in Memphis and he voted and he took a selfie you know, of, of his ballot and then tweeted that out or something, put it on his social media, encouraging young, and there was some hashtag, I don't know if it was get out the vote or whatever the, the cool kids are doing these days, but his point was, hey, I just did my early voting and you should too, Let, you know, let's get out the vote. And there's this recurring thing every four years where a lot of celebrities go and they're especially appealing to young people and the implicit message is the reason our government, the, you know, the state apparatus is so horrible is because the, the good, decent people all stay home and it's only the evil people who go and vote all the time. And, and that's not really true, right? I mean, it's because really what's going on is I think I don't I'm not in Justin Timberlake's head, but I that would be kind of odd, wouldn't it? But. I'm pretty sure what he means is, hey, all you progressives out there who really wanted Bernie, suck it up and go vote because otherwise Donald Trump's going to be the president. We don't want that, right? If, if millions of Trump, potential Trump voters saw that tweet and said, you know, Justin, you're right. I'm going to go vote. I think he'd be like, Argh! right? I, I don't think that's what he, he intended. All right. So there's, there's that issue. Really what, so if you just think about in general to just broadcast, hey, those of you who are thinking, of, you know, who are on the edge, you're thinking, eh, it's, I got to go to work that day and the lines and it. Just go ahead and vote in general, unless you thought you were targeting a particular thing, they would just cancel each other out. Right? I mean, voting is intrinsically really wasteful and stupid when you think about it. So I had a proposal one time, I put it up on Facebook, it got a lot of, a lot of likes, so I, you know, I'll share it with you guys. Uh, the market approved. I said, instead of our current system where everyone gets one vote, which is kind of wasteful, right? The people go and they largely cancel each other. What they should do is you go up to the voting booth every year and then you get as many votes as you can do legitimate push-ups, right? <laughs> Just think about that. We would still get awful leaders, right? Because in general, they would still cancel out, but now everybody would be in better shape, <laughs> right? So, I mean, but, but that just kind of underscores how this whole thing is, is incredibly wasteful if what we're trying to do is just come up with some system to see, you know, to gauge public opinion, all right? And, and Ryan has pointed out the problems with that. Now, what's, what's really funny is economists have uh, some pretty powerful results uh, formalizing, sort of crystallizing the stuff that Ryan was talking about. And in particular, it's what's called Kenneth Arrow's impossibility theorem. So let me very quickly summarize what that is. So this is Kenneth Arrow, you know, huge gun in economics, uh, not a, uh, an anarcho-capitalist by any stretch, for those of you who know him, uh, but he had this famous result. Now, I, I know for sure what the result is, but I, I heard a backstory when I was in grad school and they taught us, they told us this anecdote to, to motivate how he found it. I have not like, gone and read a biography, so this, this might just be uh, an urban legend, but the story goes that Arrow was in grad school working on you know, voting systems and so forth, and there were a lot of, of problems that economists had discovered. You know, economists had been studying voting systems at that point for decades, if not centuries, and j just to give you an example, so if the 
simple majority rule, right? That leads to problems because what, let's say the public, you know, looking at, at choices A and B, they prefer A to B, but if you looked at B versus C, they would prefer B to C, but if you looked at C and A, they prefer C to A, right? So there's a, it's, it's what's called intransitive. So th that's possible, there's nothing contradictory about that. that. That could be true, right? In sports, you could see that too, like certain teams, like this team could beat them, they could beat them, but then they would beat the first team. You, that's logically possible, so that could be the situation. So if, if that is true, then that leads to gaming the system by the people running the elections. You know, they can put the, you know, if they want candidate B to win, they just gotta make sure to arrange the sequence of, of face-offs to make sure that, you know, B faces the person B is gonna win in the last round. Whereas if B had faced somebody else early on, he would have gotten knocked out. Okay, so economists knew, in general, there's theoretical problems with all these voting systems they had come up with, and they could do all kinds of things. Like, okay, let's have 10 total points that each voter gets, and you can assign the points to the list of potential candidates. So if you really like Jim Smith, you'll give all 10 points to him, right? But if, you, if you're, eh, he's all right, I'll give him four points, and I'll give my second place person three points. You know, there's all kinds of things, but even there, there's gaming that's possible that somebody might Act not not respond truthfully. I mean, somebody might give 10 points just to the person that's their top pick, even though they really don't prefer him that much more than the second. Okay. So there's things like that where it's they studied it. So what Arrow did is he said, okay, let's just try to winnow this thing down. Let's let's just get rid of all the potential theoretical voting systems that are clearly stupid that we wouldn't want to use to then focus on the ones that you know have some intrinsic legitimacy to them, some some appeal. And so he said, all right, so what kind of rules am I going to adopt to weed out clearly bad ways of translating individual preferences into some sort of social welfare function? Okay, this is probably the first time in a Mises event someone has said social welfare function, <laughs> but I use the quotation marks, all right? So don't, don't kick me out. Okay, so you get the idea of what they're trying to do. They have a bunch of voters, like in the little model, who have preferences over things, and then we want to come up with some system to map from all the citizens' preferences to one you know, unified thing that represents the social will in terms of these preference rankings. That's what they're trying to do mathematically. So he said, all right, let me just come up with some criteria for a good mapping system, all right? And so he said, so for one thing, if every single person in society prefers A to B, whatever, you know, these are abstract things, whatever A and B are, they could be candidates, they could be policies, like should we raise taxes, they could be states of the world, like should we crack down on pollution, doesn't matter. Just very you know, abstract things because it's a mathematical model that said if every single person prefers A to B, whatever our social rule mapping is, it better not turn out that the social rule says B is better than A. Right? Everyone get that? That clearly, so they call it the unanimity rule. So that's pretty straightforward. I mean, regardless of your views of democracy, monarchy, what have you, clearly that seems kind of obvious. Yeah, that would be dumb if every single person thinks A is better than B, and yet our rule says therefore the government should do B because that's better than A. All right, stuff like that. He also said there's, it should be transitive. If the social rule thinks A is better than B and B is better than C, then it better think that A is better than C, okay? So that you avoid the cycling problems. Things like that, okay, people say, yeah, that, that makes sense, otherwise that leads to problems. Okay, uh, so he goes through and lists things like, like that. Another one was non-dictatorship, all right, which is very weak tradition just said, it's okay if in any particular outcome the social rule has identical preferences for some person in society, but it better be at least possible with some combination of individual preferences that the social rule does not always map identically to one person's preferences because otherwise that person would be a dictator. Okay, again, that's who the judge. Okay, so he goes through and lists things like that. There are some that were a little more technical that I can't really you know, just summarize for you right here, but they were all as non-objectionable as the ones I just went through. There wasn't anything that was really stretching. Once you understood what it meant, you'd be like, oh yeah, of course you would want that in any kind of sensible rule. So he went and, do, 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 and started proving. So he was looking for the space of all rules that satisfied these criteria, and it turned out it was the empty set, right? Meaning he ruled, or he, he concluded, he just ruled out and said, it is impossible to come up in general when, when you, know, you allow for people to have all kinds of preferences that they might have it's impossible to come up with a rule that satisfies all these criteria simultaneously. And so it was called Arrow's impossibility theorem. So, the, and I think, I, don't, I didn't look it up, I think he found that like in the 60s. So do you guys remember how back in the 1960s all of the economists and social scientists just abandoned their faith in democracy? You guys remember that? <laughs> right, didn't happen. 
So, I mean, that should have been a literature stopper. That's boom. I mean, that was the most unexpected. Again, they, so that's clear what the result is. I mean, I know that's what the result is, but I don't know if the, if the story I told about why he went looking for it, I don't know if that's true, but that's what I was told in, in grad school, and I don't think those people would have lied to me. So, <laughs> all right, so you can see how that's a very, it was a very unexpected result. He, he thought that he was just going to winnow it away and just find, like, let's focus on the stuff that's sensible, and then found, oops, I just ruled out all possible political systems. So, uh, so what did they do? They just went, huh, okay. And then they just kept going on and, and doing all their journal, you know, their, their peer-reviewed articles and whatever, and, and, and publishing in that area. And so this is just another example, I think, to, to underscore how these guys are, are bluffing when they say to Austrians, that, oh, you guys just use your verbal analysis, but we, you know, we're very formal and we have our mathematical model, so we know what we're talking about, and it's rigorous, but when you get something like that, they don't care and they just keep moving on. Another example, because I'm still holding a grudge on this, is my, um, my, my dissertation, one of the results I found there was, as some of you may know, the mainstream economists, they embrace what you might think is as a productivity theory of interest, right? In their models, they have that interest equals the marginal product of capital. Austrians verbally, blew that up in the 1800s. And so I was like, well, how can this be? You know, the, the math is correct in these models. They're not doing a contradiction, so how? And I realized what it was. I, I won't bore you. Their models had one good, right? So once you allow for the world to have more than one good, which some would think empirically is true, um, <laughs> the result falls away, okay? And so I just kind of did a little counterexample where I showed how, you know, if we have two or more goods, then interest doesn't equal the marginal product of capital. Like that, that doesn't even make sense in that world. You gotta work, worry about changing prices, blah, blah, blah. But if there happened to be one good, the model reduces to what you guys are teaching us here in grad school. <laughs> and so I showed, I showed this guy, and I'm, I guess I, I am making fun of him, but it's, he's a nice guy. I'm not saying he's a jerker, he was dishonest. But I showed it to this guy who was real sharp with math and everything, and I was really excited, like, I did it, you know, like Rothbard and these guys, they just didn't know to, to go do it with the math, but now I've done it, and so now it's gonna change the world. And these guys, and I showed him, he goes, somehow we know. And then he just kept going on with this thing. Somehow they know. So I think somehow they don't know, but <laughs> the point is that this is just another example of where they, you know, you, they get these results mathematically, and then if it doesn't, you know, they, they can just come up with a way, okay, well, that's interesting, and we're gonna go ahead and do something else. So uh, with voting, like I say, it's the stuff Ryan was talking about. I mean, that's, it's crystallized. You get it from mathematical economists to prove that in principle, the general will makes no sense. That's an empty concept. It's nonsense. They, they prove that in principle. All right, let me focus a little bit more now on what some of you may have heard when economists who are real cynical uh, talk about why they don't vote, right? And so there's a standard argument, let me just reiterate, just there might be people in here who've never actually heard it crystallized, and then I wanna tweak it and say, that's somewhat related to my own views as to why I don't vote, but it's not identical. And so here, the, the standard view goes something like this, an economist will say, okay, what would have to happen for your vote to be decisive, for the fact that you voted for a particular candidate versus another one, that that made the difference over who's gonna be in the White House you know, in January, and they said, first of all, the state in which you're voting has to be decisive in the electoral college, right? That if you're in some small state and the, the winner ends up winning by a, a margin in the electoral college bigger than the votes that your state has, it doesn't matter which way your state went, okay? And so you know, there's that element. And then let's say though your state is crucial, that if your state had gone the other way then a different person would have won, even there now, it needs to be the case that in your state, the popular vote is determined by a margin of one, right? That, so that that's the only circumstances in which your particular vote would change, you know, which way your state went, and then it also has to be true that your state going one way or the other determines who the president is. So just empirically, the chance of that happening is astronomically low, and so this is where they come up with this, you know, quips like, you're more likely to get in a car accident on the way to the polling booth than to actually determine who the next president's gonna be. Right? So some economists who are real hard-boiled and cynical give that kind of argument and then say, and therefore, that's why I don't vote because I know it's not gonna affect anything, QED, and they, they, they step away. So th there's, it's important to look, work through that logic, but strictly speaking, I don't think that's a great argument. That's a very utilitarian uh, argument and you wouldn't, or at least most normal people, would shy away from applying that logic in other areas. So for example, we're walking down and we see some guy passed out on a park bench and his wallet's hanging out. 
And you wouldn't say, oh, well, let's take his wallet. You, Whoa, that's, that's stealing. You can't do that. And he goes, well, look, at, there's lots of people coming and going. What are the chances someone's not going to take his wallet, right? It might as well be me. It's not going to affect the outcome. This, you know, no matter what, <laughs> this guy's, his wallet's gone. I might as well get it, right? <laughs> so you can see there how that wouldn't follow, at least necessarily. It would if you were you know, complete utilitarian you know, in an in a amoral sense and had no value system, but you can see how that argument by itself. So it's not that I endorse the version of the economist argument for not voting I just gave you. What Mine's a little bit different. What I tell people is what makes no sense is when someone says, oh yeah, I'm voting for so-and-so, it turns my stomach, I can't stand the guy, or, or in today's election, it's like, I can't stand her, but you know, it's, it's, I'm avoiding the, the, the greater of, of two evils by doing this, all right? And, that, and, that's, and so that's why I'm doing it. Yeah, I agree. And so you could sit there and try to say all the horrible things about the candidate for whom they're planning to vote, and the person could say, yeah, I stipulate all that. It's just, you know, the other person's even worse, so that's why I'm doing it. So there, what I'm saying, and this is the, where the title of my talk comes, if you saw it in the brochure, is I'm saying it doesn't make sense to do something that you think is kind of immoral or you're voting for a bad person, that someone you really actually don't like, whose policies don't come anywhere near your preferences because you think you're acting smart and pragmatically. Because no, you're not. Your particular vote does absolutely nothing. And so if it's not something you feel good about, then there's no point in doing that. So to give it a silly analogy, just to drive home this point, you're over at your friend's house and um, you're getting ready to leave. He goes, oh, hang on, hang on one second, I need five minutes. And he takes out magnets on his fridge and spells it T-R-U-M-P. He goes, okay, now we can go. You're like, what, what did you just do that for? And he's like, because Hillary's trying to take our guns. That's why. <laughs> you're like, what? what? What is that? And he's like, Bob, Supreme Court. That's why I did this. And what do you say? And so the, the point is, the guy, he just kept sitting there telling you how bad Hillary was, and that's why he arranged Trump on his fridge. You would be utterly baffled. But by the same token, when someone's trying to explain to me why next week they're going to go and pull the lever for Trump in a voting booth, I'm equally baffled that the two have nothing to do with whether Hillary's in, in power or not, right? Now, the obvious response is people say, wait a minute, Bob, you're, you're, that's clever and there's something fishy though because if everybody acted like you, well then Hillary is going to win. And I say, okay, if everybody acted like me, then there'd be 150 million podcasts taking down Paul Krugman every week, right? <laughs> So that would be awesome. I would much rather have that. All right, so again, just look at where the logic goes, though, even in terms of voting. So, okay, right. So that's why if you're agreeing with me that you really don't like Trump, you know, it's like, and you don't like, you know, uh, what's Gary Johnson and so on. Okay, go write in whatever. Go write in Lou Rockwell or something, right? So if, if, what, if, the, if the reasoning you're using is I want to, you know, be Immanuel Kant and do the thing that I wish everyone else would do, Okay, so go right in the candidate you really like. Because that, you see what I'm saying? So it's this weird thing where they flip back and forth between pragmatism and idealism, where they're saying, oh no, I'm doing this thing that ugh, I feel queasy about because I'm just looking at the consequences and I'm pointing out, no, consequentially, your thing has nothing to do with whether Trump or Hillary is elected. And then they say, okay, but I can't just reason selfishly like that. I gotta take one for the team and do what I want the team to do. I say, right, you just told me you wish the team would all vote for you know, Ron Paul or somebody like that. So why don't you go ahead, if, if you are going to go vote. So anyway, that's the thing. I'm not telling people what to do. I'm just trying to get them to see that a lot of times the justification when they try to explain to me why they're doing what they're doing, it doesn't make any sense. They keep flipping back and forth. So let me, in the few minutes I have left here now, talk a little bit about, you know, why I've taken the stance I have and then to get you to see how this affects um, the power of the state. So I think the part of why I don't like voting, and, uh, and, and now this is less of an unpopular opinion. So as, as Jeff was talking about how there's silver linings here, for me, the silver lining has been in previous elections, I, I don't like confrontation. Like if I'm at a social gathering and people want to start talking about politics, I usually just nod my head and I don't get into it. But you know, if someone point blank was saying, well, who are you going to vote for? In previous elections, if I said, oh, I don't vote, they would get mad at me, right? Like they would really, you know, people have died for this, and, and they get really mad. <laughs> You know, because, because the Fuhrer was sitting around thinking, how can I keep Bob Murphy from voting? You know, that's, that's what they were, he's like, how many Panzer divisions do we devote to that? And they were, all right. So, the, um, so, so what they're, but, but this time around, 
talking to no, you know, normal people or whatever, and then they say, what are you doing? And I say, oh, I don't vote. And they'll just go, yeah. You know, they, they don't get mad. Like this time around, <laughs> people at least see the appeal of that. Like, oh, you're just not gonna participate. That's interesting. Let me think about that, you know? So, um, so th th that's, that's the one, one silver lining. But part of, of my rationale for that is because, as Ryan was, was pointing out here, they, they liked to use it to legitimize, legitimize the state, right? The, the cliche of if you don't vote, you have no right to complain, that sort of thing. That they, they want to go through these elections so that people feel like, well, you know, we just lost this time around. So if we don't like what Hillary's doing, then, you know, four years from now, we just got to put in new people. Right? They, they, the people running the state like that mentality. They want you to think that the only avenue by which you can affect social change is by going and knocking on doors and getting people to sign petitions to get your guy or your woman on the ballot next time around. They like thinking that that's the, the, the channel through which you have to move. And in general, no, that's not true. As, as Mises, he was um, relaying a point that David Hume made, all governments rest on public opinion, even totalitarian dictatorships, right? And so it, it's, you know, the, the function, the social function from their point of view of, of having periodic elections is just to reassure the masses that you, you, this is a representative system. And so if you don't like what we're doing, don't worry, just, you know, go to the polls later on. And so if, if you can do other things to try to get the public to reduce their respect for the people in power, then that's also very effective. And so clearly that, that's what, I, what I've been doing with my time. So it's not that I'm apathetic, it's that I think there's better uses of my time than fretting over, you know, oh gee, who are we gonna vote for this next time around? Let me just I'll give you a few observations to drive home that point. So some people, when they hear that kind of talk, they think it's very naive. And they say, no, these totalitarian dictatorships, I mean, they have a police state. If you criticize the government, they lock you up or they you, know, you just disappear. So that's what keeps those people in power. I mean, that, that is true, that's one necessary element of their control, but it's also, they control public opinion there. If, if it were correct to say that in these really totalitarian states, it's all about who, how many guns they have and it's not about public opinion, then in those totalitarian states, they would have open media, that the schools would have nothing to do with the government, the, the ruler wouldn't care. He'd say, yeah, go ahead and teach whatever you want in school, go ahead and look whatever you want on the internet because if you challenge me, you're dead. But that's not what they do. It's precisely in these closed societies where the ruler has much more power than they do in so-called Western societies where they have the, the tightest control over the information that people get because it's in those societies in particular where most people have to not know how bad it is. Otherwise, the regime would fall. All right. Uh, I, I saw somebody come to NYU one time and he gave a really interesting talk about what was called network goods. And he was talking about, he, he had this example where he said that in totalitarian regimes in particular, they have to quickly scrub anti-regime graffiti, right? That if somebody you know, in the middle of the night climbs up on a bridge and says, you know, the, the ruler's bad or down with so-and-so, the regime has to quickly scrub that because it's, it's, a, it's a focal point, it's a signal. When other dissidents see that, it's not merely that they see it and say, oh, there's at least one other person who thinks like me. It's also not that they know, oh, wait a minute, other people who might be disaffected are seeing that but they all know that they all know it, right? So it's like a, it's, it sort of builds a spree de corps, and so that kind of thing needs to be scrubbed immediately. So in terms of our uh, system here, let me just try to, hopefully this works. Okay, great, so I don't know, I'll try to read this to you, I don't know if you guys can see it in the back. So uh, Hillary Clinton had a tweet a while ago, she said, if the FBI is watching you for a suspected terrorist links, you shouldn't be able to just go buy a gun with no questions asked. So this wise guy says, if the FBI is investigating you, you shouldn't be able to run for president. <laughs> okay, but now, but now those of you who use Twitter, you, you know, and you do this probably without even thinking about it, what do you do when you see something you love and it's hilarious? You go and check and see how many other people have liked this or retweeted it. And so it's not just that this guy had a great zinger, but you look and say, oh, 3.2 thousand people liked this status or this tweet that this guy put out. So if you're you know, concerned about a Hillary Clinton presidency or whatever, this thing gives you hope. It's not just that you derived enjoyment out of seeing this guy zing her, it's you realize 3,000 other people you know, saw this, so then you extrapolate and say, well, you know, how many people weren't at their computer or whatever, so you see, oh, there must be many millions of Americans who would have read this and thought this is hilarious, right? So you see the function of this and how in terms of undermining the legitimacy of of, the, of, a, of a corrupt regime, 
the, the methods we have right now. It's not merely that we can beam information into millions of people's brains uh, very with low cost. It's that we can all be aware of just of what our numbers are. And it's this kind of thing. So in terms of you know, undermining uh, Clinton, a potential Clinton presidency, whether she gets in or not, to me, the, the two seconds it took this guy to send that tweet out is way more useful than him waiting in a line and casting a vote for somebody against Hillary on election day. And so I guess it, it sounds like I'm wrapping up and saying, so, okay, everyone, go out there and get on Twitter. That's not really what I'm saying. What I'm saying is voting is so useless that even being on Twitter is way more useful. <laughs> All right, thank you.